So what I want to do is create a background for you that will make this chart make sense. And the chart hopefully makes sense. And the chart was something where I could condense a gob of information into a relatively small amount. But when you use it, you have to kind of use the PowerPoints in the lecture to help integrate. All right. So when we look at the interface system, the hypothalamus is kind of the driver of the system. So, so, so we have the hypothalamus that initiates the process. Okay. And when we think about the endocrine system, what we're interested in is specialized cells that produce a hormone. Since we're dealing with endocrine hormones, and endocrine hormones are released in the blood, in the blood they circulate to tissues, and specialized cells in the tissues. And if these cells have a receptor that the hormone can bind to, so we have hormone receptors, then we call that a target cell, because it's the target of the hormone. And then what hormones do is change the activity of cells in various ways. Okay. So the way we have to think about it then is so a cell produces a hormone, hormones released in the blood, targets a new cell, changes the activity of the cell. So what the hypothalamus does is replace, is produce a bunch of hormones that we end in RH or IH. So in other words, when you're looking at this list, then if you look at this column where it says the hypothalamus, then all the, most of them listed there are RH hormones, so GNRH, TRH, PRH, uh, CRH, GHRH. So RH is for releasing hormone. And that typically has a positive effect. And then IH is for inhibiting hormone. And that typically has a negative effect. And then these hormones are released to the blood. And where the hypothalamic hormones go is to the anterior pituitary. So in the anterior pituitary, then we're going to have special cells. That have the receptors for these hormones. So then if you look at the next column, somatotroph, corticotroph, lactotroph, thyrotroph, gonadotroph, those are the cells of the anterior pituitary that these hormones target, the releasing hormones and the inhibiting hormones. All right? Now what happens is the anterior pituitary, these special cells also release hormones. And so we can call those anterior pituitary hormones. And the anterior pituitary hormones then are going to be released to the blood. Where they are going to go to other target tissues or cells. Okay. So if you kind of think about it, then what we what we the first column is telling you that we're, we're this this entire piece of this chart is dealing with the anterior pituitary. All right. This is some control mechanisms that we're going to discuss eventually. But here's the hypothalamus. So this column is what are the releasing hormones that are going to cause these cells to increase the production of the hormone. These are the cells of the anterior pituitary. And then these are the hormones produced by the anterior pituitary. So ACTH, FSH, LH, 
HGH, RL, PRL. If you look at this column, these are all hormones produced by the anterior pituitary. So now the next column is the target tissue for these hormones. So for example, follicle stimulating hormone and luteinizing hormone target the ovaries. And so that's the target tissue for that anterior pituitary hormone. And then the next column is the effect of the hormone. So follicle stimulating hormone, luteinizing hormone, ovaries, causes maturation of the follicle or the production of an egg every month, right? And then the last two columns are clinical concerns of what happens if you don't have enough hyposecretion of a hormone or what happens if you have too much hypersecretion of a hormone, all right? So this first deal where it says anterior pituitary follows this. The rest of the chart is a subset of that information or information that isn't organized in this linear pathway that we're talking here. So to make sense out of that, then if we were dealing with the thyroid, this gland, then the releasing hormone would be TRH. The anterior pituitary special cells would be thyrotrophs. Those would produce TSH. TSH then would target the thyroid and cause the thyroid to release T3 and T4. And then T3 and T4 would have target cells in effect. So what you can do here is I already, I already did the first part of it on the first chart. So here's TRH, here's thyrotrophs, here's TSH, and then here's thyroid. So then I took the thyroid and I brought it down here. Then I, I, re, I, I created a review so that you knew that TRH is required, TSH is required, and then we got specific in the thyroid. Follicular cells in the thyroid produce T3 T4. So their target tissue, which would be down here now, is general body cells where it helps regulate growth development uh, and then clinically uh, graves disease, uh, creatism, myxedema would be things that we're going to talk about, right? So that's the way this chart works for you. So for example, if you went to, to the adrenal gland here, then the adrenal gland was back on this chart. So again, what we did is we said, well, this, this affects the adrenal cortex. So the linear relationship is here to the adrenal cortex. So now if you go to the adrenal gland, then we just pick up the story there, remind you again what some of the, 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 the uh, overriding control mechanisms are. Here's the specific cells in the adrenal gland. Here's the hormones that are produced. Here's the target tissue of those hormones. Here's the effect of the hormones, and here's some clinical concerns again. Okay. So the chart is designed as a continuation of thought. Yeah. So pretty much everything starts with a hypothalamus. Yeah, now the exception to that are things like the parathyroid uh, and the pineal gland that aren't really controlled by the hypothalamus. So there are some that don't follow this. In, in looking at it, I, I should probably rearrange it a little bit, and that would help with uh, But for example, the pancreas really isn't impacted by that. When you get to the ovaries and testes, they are. So that will follow that next chart. Um, and then what we're going to end up with when we talk about development is the baby's placenta is an endocrine organ. And it's, it's designed to release hormones that target mom and cause mom's body to do certain things which benefit baby. So, so we'll end up with that. Yeah. Um, underneath pancreas, there's a couple empty boxes underneath the endocrine gland. Is that all part of the pancreas? So here you mean? Down below. Yeah. Below the pancreas. On the Oh, the, this is all pancreas. Okay. Excuse me. I 
I should have uh, not put the blocks in there. No, I just wanted to make sure. Thank you. I'll correct that. Yeah, those blocks should be there. Yeah, it's a working project. Yeah. Every time I use it, I see some other things I should change. And I just start like, rearranging it so that all of the interior pituitary follows and then the ones that aren't related would, would be all grouped together, right? So what we're going to do is embark on discussions about this. Um, and there's another one I'm going to go through in the lab with. And so what we're going to do is we're going to start with Lecture 1A today. Hopefully get into Lecture 1B a little bit. Tomorrow I'll finish 1B and 2. And we're going to use Lecture 3 and 4 in lab form. On Thursday, do uh, parts of the other parts of Lecture 3 and 4. And then that would leave the final parts of 3 and 4 in Lecture 5 to do on Tuesday and Friday. Right. So just kind of as a quick overview of what we were just talking about, is we have specialized tissues that produce hormones. We call them endocrine hormones if they are circulated via the blood. So the thing about all endocrine glands is they produce hormones that are circulated to their target tissues in the blood. So when you look at it, the hypothalamus and pituitary are closely related to one another both uh, parts of the brain. What we're going to see uh, in a little bit is we're going to take the pituitary and divide it into anterior and posterior. And the posterior pituitary is definitely an outpocket of the brain. The anterior pituitary is not. So we're going to see a different relationship between those two. And then toward the back of the brain, superior to our cerebellum, we have a little gland that we're going to talk about, the pineal gland, that's an endocrine gland. So three of our glands that we're going to talk about are in the brain themselves. As we continue downward, we have the thyroid gland that sits underneath the larynx. And on the back of the thyroid gland, we have some glandular material we call parathyroids. Uh, below the thyroid gland, there's a little gland called the thymus that I don't really spend much time lecturing, but it's on that chart I just showed you in terms of generally what you need to know. And then as we get into the abdomen, we're going to review the pancreas again, the islets of Langerhans and talk about the adrenal glands that sit on top of the kidneys. And then we're going to continue down into the pelvis, uh, where we have embryonic tissue that, under the, under the direction of hormones, differentiates into either ovaries or testes. And we'll talk about how this tissue can become either one in either gender. It's all hormone-based communication. If you have the wrong hormones, then you have a different outcome than if you have the right one. So we're going to talk about that. So we get the ovaries in women that are endocrine organs <coughs> and the testes in men that are endocrine organs. So really what we're doing is coming full circle at the end of this quarter and kind of finishing a thought that was the end of the last quarter. And that's that homeostasis is created by two systems, the nervous system that we did at the end of last quarter and finally the endocrine system that we're doing at the end of this quarter. Some people teach the endocrine system right after the nervous system. I tried it once in my career and said never again, because I had to teach all of anatomy and physiology just to make that make sense. So I thought, why don't we put it at the end? Well, we've covered a bunch of stuff that's going to make it make sense. So I kind of like that. So what we're going to do is find out that it helps maintain homeostasis, including chemical composition, volume of your internal environment, metabolic and energy balance, biological clock, circadian rhythms, contraction of smooth and cardiac muscle, glandular secretions, maintains the immune system, controls your growth and development from a single cell to a multicellular adult, and regulates the operation of the reproductive system. So it's, a, it creates, it's an amazing system. All right. So to kind of review real quickly, what we do, what we're going to cover are endocrine hormones. So we have an endocrine gland with cells that produce a hormone. The hormone is circulated in the blood, as we just talked about. And then it's going to uh, exit the blood in capillary beds 
where it is going to have target cells, and the target cells have to have a unique receptor to bind the hormone to it to have the hormone have an effect. Right? So that's the pattern of endocrine hormones. In the past, we have talked about some hormones, particularly in the digestive system, that were hormones that were paracrine hormones, where we have one cell re releasing the hormone, travels through intercellular fluids to a neighboring cell. So pancreatic polypeptide, for example, released by islands of Langerhans, but affects center cells next door. So paracrine hormones. And then the weirdest of which we're not going to talk about at all, but it's just kind of, when you think about it, it's like a bizarre control mechanism. But it's the way the nucleus can indirectly control the activity of a cell, and they're called autocrine hormones, where the nucleus makes a hormone, the hormones release the interstitial fluid, the cell has the target receptor, and the hormone affects the activity of the cell. <laughs> so that one's kind of a bizarre mechanism where it's the nucleus directly affecting the activity of the cell produces a hormone that affects the activity of the cell. So that's kind of a weird pattern. Now, when, so, so endocrine hormones, paracrine hormones, autocrine hormones are all examples. We're going to spend our time with primarily endocrine hormones. So when we look at endocrine hormones, they're chemically either lipid-based or protein-based molecules largely. So uh, lipid-based molecules are all based upon the, the, the molecule cholesterol. We'll go through that you know, a little later, showing you that kind of pathway. And so we have to have a cholesterol molecule to build these hormones. We build them on smooth ER because they're lipid-based. We package them with Golgi apparatus and then we release the hormones from the cell. So what happens is, because they're, they're lipid-based molecules, they don't transport well in the blood. So we have to have proteins that bind with the hormone you carry it in the blood, which are called transport proteins. Once we get to a capillary bed, the hormones come free of the transport protein and diffuse through the cell membrane. So one of the unique things about all lipid-soluble hormones that are based upon cholesterol as a molecule, uh, they have an internal receptor. And the internal receptor is typically within the nucleus of the cell. And when the hormone binds with this internal receptor, it's usually a gene expression agent. And so it causes you to uh, read genes. And then by reading genes, you control the activity of the cell. So classic example is both men and women have breast buds. Women develop breasts because they're exposed to estrogen. Estrogen turns on the genes on the cell that knows how to make breasts. Men typically don't get breasts because they don't have estrogen. Give a man estrogen, and they will develop breasts. Okay. So it's all controlling genes. So there, if you, there's a great story. She's kind of a humorist, um, and she wrote a book called Why Men Have Nipples. So if you have a little reading time, you read it, want to read a funny book. It's called Why Men Have Nipples. And the reason is is because if you're a woman, you get two X chromosomes, one from your dad. So one from your father and one from your mother. If you're a guy, you get the X chromosome from your mother, but you get a Y chromosome from your dad. And the X chromosome knows how to make nipples. There you go. Long story short. And so if you elderly, when men get older, they tend to put more adipose tissue on their chest. Yeah, man boobs. <laughs> and it's because testosterone levels are dropping and fat cells produce estrogen. <laughs> Alright. So it's so the key to this understanding on um, lipid soluble hormones is they alter gene expression. Critically okay. important to some of our discussion in the future. So the examples would be aldosterone that we talked about when we did the the uh, kidney and the production of, of uh, uh, and the removal of sodium 
And calcitrol would be another example. Then the ones we really think about as steroid hormones, which are which are lipid-based hormones, would be testosterone in men, estrogen in women, progesterone uh, in women, and then T3, T4, which are thyroid hormones. So all the other hormones are, are water-soluble water hormones. So they're typically protein-based molecules. Uh, because they're water-soluble, they're charged, which makes them uh, dissolve in water easily. But because they're charged, they do not like to go through the hydrophobic part of the cell membrane. So remember, membranes are made up of bilipid layers, where the lipids overlap so that you get a charge on the outside of the membrane. This is a nonpolar region of the membrane. So the larger the molecule, the more charged the molecule, the less likely it's going to go through the polar region of the membrane. So to account for that, we cannot have internal receptors. So we have to have membrane-bound receptors. So water-soluble hormones uh, are dependent upon membrane-bound receptors that are in the membrane of the cell. And then what we have to do is create a pattern where we can create an internal messenger. Since a hormone can't enter the cell, it can't be the direct messenger like a fat-soluble hormone can. So typically what we have is a molecule on the inside of the membrane called a G protein. When the hormone binds with the receptor, it activates the G protein, which activates a enzyme called uh, cyclic uh, adenylate cyclase, which converts ATP to cyclic AMP. And then cyclic AMP becomes our secondary messenger in the cell, and it guides the activity of the cell largely by controlling enzyme activity within the cell. So a very different pattern, not involved in gene expression, but involved in how enzymes are used that have been pre-made. Okay. So do two very different patterns to that. So epinephrine and norepinephrine, which are catch call amines, uh, released from the adrenal medulla, belong to this group. All of the hypothalamic hormones we were talking about that are releasing hormones and inhibiting hormones belong to this group. Uh, oxytocin, ADH, ADH, remember, antidiuretic hormone. Oxytocin is the hormone that causes labor contractions in pregnant women. Uh, and then human growth hormone, thyroid stimulating hormone, uh, adrenal corticotropic hormone, follicle stimulating hormone, luteinizing hormone, prolactin, melanocyte stimulating hormone. These are all water-based hormones. So the take-home message is, are there more water-based soluble hormones or lipid-based So the list goes on and on for water-based hormones. Okay. So parathyroid hormone, insulin, lipidon, somatostatin, and great polypeptide, calcitonin. All right, so the second thing that's kind of important about the endocrine system is understanding how hormones interact with each other and how hormones interact with target tissue. So what happens is that we can have, we have a dynamic system in our body. We have a kidney and a liver that break down hormones. So even though we're producing these hormones all the time, we have two organs that tend to break them down, the liver and our kidney. So because these guys break down the hormones or release them, then what we have to do is constantly release new hormones if we want the system to work. So the reason why women who are on oral contraceptives have to take a birth control pill every morning is because the kidney is dumping the hormones out of your body in your urine. In fact, you dump enough estrogen, progesterone, from birth control pills that in a study where they took fish that could change their gender, and they put male fish in a cage where the sewage treatment facility dumped into the river, there was enough estrogen in them to convert them to female fish. So there's a big concern, particularly in the eastern part of the United States, where you have giant municipalities like Pittsburgh that's on a major river, and the river goes somewhere else, and the next city gets its drinking water from the river, 
that there's estrogenic effects from the people who were urinating in the city before the city where you live. So, fortunately in Spokane, our drinking water comes from an aquifer. Otherwise, Coeur d'Alene and Post Falls dump their sewage treatment in the Spokane River. It comes to us, and we would be redrinking some of that stuff. Yeah. Yeah, there's been quite a bit of work done on uh, decline in sperm production in, in the United States by young men and because of estrogenic effects found in drinking water. The world is a giant recycler. So sometimes it's, it's not good to know that you recycle. <laughs> but in the East, where a lot of the drinking water comes from cities, you're just recycling. Was dumped into the river above. Where did it happen? You reach 50 and yeah. <laughs> it happens. <laughs> so. All right. So, how do we avoid this? Well, we have to produce new hormones, right? Now, a cell can also alter what it's doing because it can increase the receptor load in the membrane or it can decrease the receptor load in the membrane. So not only do we have cells producing more hormones, but we have target cells that can adjust their response to hormones as well. So downregulation and upregulation is how target cells adjust their response to elevated or decreased hormones. So in downregulation, target cells uh, remove receptors from their membrane. And then in upregulation, target cells increase the number of receptors in the membrane. So we have, a, we have a, a, a receptor load in our membranes, and we can alter those. And we can alter them on a fairly quick pattern. So membranes, once we create them, aren't just stagnant things that sit around. Membranes on cells are very, very dynamic. They can be altered quickly. All right, so the other thing we can do is we can link the interaction between hormones together. So for example, some hormones are known to be per permissive hormones. And that's when the action or hormone of a target cell requires either the same stimulation or recent exposure to a second hormone. So uh, milk production in women would be a classic example of this permissive effect. So breast tissue, if you're not pregnant, doesn't produce milk typically. So all we have to do is we have to prepare breast tissue to make milk. So for the first nine months of your pregnancy, you are using progesterone and estrogen as a hormone that prepares the breast to make milk. And then when you want to make milk, you have to have another hormone called prolactin that's going to cause the breast tissue to make milk. So if you just expose breast tissue to prolactin, they can't, it can't make much milk. It has to be prepared to make the milk by, by progesterone and estrogen ahead of time. So that's a permissive effect where one hormone has to precede the other hormone in a sequence of events to cause that to occur. Are down-regulation and up-regulation only in water-soluble hormones? Uh, no, it can be internal as well. I, it, it happens with estrogen, progesterone, or something. So if and so, permissive becomes a little confusing with if we think about the two hormones being together at the same time. So it's a little easier in a general thing to think about uh, a sequence of hormone events that has to occur uh, because synergistic hormones are hormones that that occur together. So. Early birth control pills were very high in estrogen. They increased stroke risk, heart attack, and cervical cancer, ovarian cancer, and breast cancer. So what they had to do is figure out that even though estrogen was a player, the progesterone was a bigger player. And as soon as they figured that out, they could decrease the amount of estrogen, greatly increase the amount of progesterone, and create a birth control that was a pill that was much, much safer. And that's because they're synergistic where the two acting together have a, a much greater effect. 
So by increasing progesterone, you could keep the effect of estrogen in place with much lower estrogen levels. Uh, and so that's what the modern birth control pills that are taken today have done, is, is greatly re decrease the estrogen load uh, and increase progesterone levels to deal with that. And antagonistic hormones have opposite actions. So testosterone and estrogen are antagonistic hormones. If you are XY, and you never produce testosterone, then you will be female. If you're XY and you're exposed to estrogen, you will be female. So testosterone drives maleness. Uh, the lack of testosterone drives females. All right, so as a quick review, remember when we look at our brain, this is a sagittal section CAT scan of the brain, then we had the corpus callosum, which was kind of our bridge between the two hemispheres. Below the corpus callosum, we had a mass of tissue on either side of the midline that we called the thalamus. And then there was a little connector that connected the thalamus together, which was a good landmark called the intermediate mass of the thalamus. And then below the thalamus is this triangular mass of tissue right here, which is the hypothalamus. And then associated with the hypothalamus is a downward extension right here, which is the so we have this relationship between the hypothalamus and our pituitary. So the hypothalamus controls the pituitary gland by releasing what we call releasing and inhibiting hormones. So releasing hormones are going to elevate the activity of cells in the anterior pituitary. Inhibiting hormones are going to decrease the activity of cells in the anterior pituitary. Now the other thing that's pretty fascinating is when we look at the pituitary, we can divide the pituitary into an anterior pituitary, and we can divide the, and a posterior pituitary. The anterior pituitary develops in the roof of your mouth uh, when your mouth is developing, and it migrates upward and attaches to the posterior pituitary. The posterior pituitary develops as a downward outpocketing of the hypothalamus, and so it's actually directly connected to your brain. So we end up with a gland that we call a pituitary that has two distinct halves that look very different histologically and therefore function differently because this one does not develop from nervous tissue and this one develops from nervous tissue. So what we see with the posterior pituitary is a connection to the hypothalamus. And so what we have is we have neurons whose cell bodies are in the hypothalamus. And their axons pass down into the posterior pituitary. So their axons passing out of the hypothalamus into the posterior pituitary can, take, can connect the brain and the posterior pituitary directly together in a structure that we learned when we did the brain called the infundibulum. And remember a track is part of the central nervous system that looks like a nerve. The nerves are part of the peripheral nervous system. So what we have is a hypothalamal hypophyseal tract, which is this <coughs> extension of axons from the, the hypothalamus into the posterior pituitary. So because the machinery to make the, the hormones is in the cell body, then the posterior pituitary technically produces no hormones because there's no cell machinery to produce hormones, but releases hormones that were produced in the hypothalamus. So technically, it stores and releases hormones that does not synthesize any hormones. And two hormones we're going to talk about that are released from the posterior pituitary are ADH and oxytocin. ADH we have already covered for two units. It's antidiuretic hormone and it makes you pee more or pee less. It makes you pee less, concentrate your urine. So it's our hormone of dehydration or overhydration. Dehydration. At one time, like when I was in school, taking anatomy and physiology, we thought that there was only one hormone released from the posterior pituitary and that it had different receptors on target cells which made it work differently. And then under careful, careful clinical uh, 
uh, research and biochemical research, we figured out that it wasn't the same worm that it was. It's a protein molecule with slightly different structure. So now we divide it into ADH and oxytocin. And oxytocin is the hormone that causes the delivery process in pregnant women and milk let down in pregnant women, post menopausal women. So when we look at the posterior pituitary, and in, in all things in anatomy and physiology, there's a common name and a more technical name. So the, the technical name for the posterior pituitary is the neural hypothesis. And that reminds us that the posterior pituitary develops as an outpocketing of the hypothalamus, neural hypothesis, right? So when we look at it clinically, what we see is the, uh, in histology, what we see is the axons of these neurosecretory cells passing down into the posterior pituitary, and then some supportive cells that act like astrocytes and, and the supportive cells we talked about in the nervous system, which are called pituocytes. So in lab, we should be able to see both of those. Um, store the hormones. Are stored and released. Right. So ADH is our friend from two discussions where we have high blood osmolarity. It's because we're dehydrated. If we're dehydrated, we want to pee more or pee less. Pee less. So the neurosecretory cells increase their production of ADH. ADH is released from the posterior pituitary. It causes the kidney to retain more water because it causes the principal cells to produce a new membrane-bound protein called aquaporin 2. It helps us reabsorb water and then uh, changes our sweat production, decreases our sweat production, and also does vasoconstriction to maintain core circulation. It tends to to decrease extremities to decrease the blood flow to your extremities, which is in the wintertime if you're an extreme athlete, you become dehydrated, it can lead you to frostbite more easily because you have less blood flow to your extremities. So the other one, oxytocin, actually creates the birthing process. So what happens, long story short, that we'll eventually put together is baby through the placenta releases a hormone that targets mom's hypothalamus, causes the production of oxytocin. So even though mom's been pregnant for nine months and she's saying, I'm done with this, let's get this over, baby says, not yet, until baby says it's time to do it. And then what happens is oxytocin targets uh, uterine smooth muscle because it has unique receptors to the oxytocin, that smooth muscle in your digestive system and your, in other parts of your body don't have, and therefore it causes the birthing contractions. And it's a classic pattern where the more hormone you get, the stronger and the harder the contractions are. So that's how we can induce labor using a artificial man-made oxytocin called pitocin, and we can actually induce labor using it. Then once the baby is born, and this is really kind of cool, we're going to talk about when we do development. Since baby is in an aquatic environment for nine months, if you sit in a bathtub for a couple hours, what happens to your skin? It's all wrinkled. Baby is actually covered with this really waxy-like stuff that kept it from being impacted by all of that water. It sometimes comes off easily, sometimes not so easily. It's kind of cool. Then once mom starts breastfeeding, then what we want to do is trigger milk, let down out of the breasts, otherwise mom would go around all day just draining milk like crazy out of her breasts. So we want to kind of conserve that so that it doesn't happen as much. So that when you stimulate the nipple, then you get an increase in oxytocin production, which results in milk let down. Uh, it could be uh, oral stimulation by the baby or physical stimulation with fingers that can result in the same thing. Now what happens is the oxytocin then targets uh, smooth muscle in the ducts of the breast that moves more, quick, more quickly toward the nipple and creates a, problem, a uh, situation we call milk let down. So sometimes there's an auditory reflex that's kind of interesting where if mom hears baby crying, then uh, that'll begin to begin the production of oxytocin so the milk let down occurs more quickly. So sometimes 
you know, mom's not got out to eat, left baby with the babysitter for a while, still breastfeeding. So she says, well, we need to go out and have a nice dinner. So they go out, baby cries next, in the booth next, or the table next to the restaurant, and she gets milk let down. So you always have to go prepare because you can get wet. <laughs> There's a cool auditory response to that as well. All right. So, when we look at the anterior pituitary, the anterior pituitary is real glandular in construction, isn't related to the, the way the posterior pituitary is connected, and has no direct relationship to the hypothalamus. So the communication between the hypothalamus and the anterior pituitary is blood-based, so that's why we have to produce releasing hormones and inhibiting hormones that enter the blood. The second place they go is the anterior pituitary, where they enter a capillary bed, come out of the blood, and then target cells in the anterior pituitary. So what we have is we have a portal system again, where we have two capillary beds that are inherently linked to one another like we saw in the liver, like we saw in the kidneys, where we have a hypothalamic uh, a capillary bed, and then we have this hypophyseal portal vein that drains this capillary bed to a second capillary bed, the anterior pituitaries. So the RH and IH factors are enter the blood here, circulate first to the anterior pituitary, and then uh, come out of the blood in that capillary bed and in target specific cells. So what we have is we have a population of five cells that are in the anterior pituitary that produce hormones. So if we go through the cells real quickly, somatotrophs are one of the cells. What we're, what we're going to try to do is produce, is connect hormones to cells that are, that are producing the hormone and then connect target cells that are impacted by the hormone. So somatotrophs, are controlled by the hypothalamus by, by GHRH, which would increase their activity, and GHIH, which would decrease their activity. If we increase GHRH in somatotrophs, it causes somatotrophs to produce human growth hormone. If we increase GHIH, then it causes somatotrophs to decrease their production of human growth hormone. So to control growth in a baby, you have to have an increase in GHRH that causes an increase in human growth hormone, that causes growth. Kids don't grow at a, a constant rate. They actually grow plateau, grow plateau, grow plateau. So during plateau rate periods, the amount of GHRH drops, and you don't get as much human growth hormone. That's why they don't grow. How's the body to catch up? Once you've reached adult stature, uh, if you're a woman, by the time you're usually 18, if you're a man, by the time you're 21, 22, then you don't need large amounts of human growth hormone ever again in your life. So you'll really produce very little GnRH for the rest of your life and more GHIH. And you just need a little human growth hormone to guide tissue repair and replacement. So it's kind of a cool pattern to it. A second cell that we find in the anterior pituitary is a thyrotroph. Again, thyrotrophs are controlled by the hypothalamus via TRH, which is thyroid thyrotrophin releasing hormone. TRH, if it is targets the thyrotrophs, causes the thyrotrophs to release thyroid stimulating hormone. So if TRH goes up, GSH, G, GSH, I mean, TSH would go up. So if TRH goes up, TSH goes up. And then the inhibiting hormone is believed to be G, GHIH. And it may be a number one of those things where Chemically, if you do kind of crude chemistry, they look the same. And what we have to do is probably a little more elaborate chemistry. It'd be just subtle, little subtly where a hydrogen atom is on the molecule. They can change the way they behave. So it's pretty amazing. Another uh, cell are gonadotrophs that we find in our anterior pituitary. What controls gonadotroph activity is gonadotrophin releasing hormone. When you were born till you start puberty, there's very little GN, GnRH being produced. Therefore, there's no, the gonadotroph activity is really low. As you enter puberty, 
the amount of uh, GnRH that you're producing goes up, and therefore the activity of the gonadotropes go up, and they increase their activity of follicle production of follicle stimulating hormone and luteinizing hormone. And what's fascinating that we're going to be able to learn about is that in men that level is a constant level to about 19, 21, 22, 23, where it peaks. And after that, it's a subtle decline for the rest of the man's life. In women, it peaks at the start of every ovarian cycle and completely shuts down at the end of an ovarian cycle and peaks again toward the next ovarian cycle. So that women are going from very high levels of, of hormones to very low levels of hormone on a monthly basis. So two very different patterns between the, the genders. Right? So lactotrophs are another group of cells, and they're typically uh, produced prolactin. Prolactin causes milk production. If you're not pregnant, you don't want to be producing milk. And if you're male, you don't want to be producing milk. So what would cause you to produce milk is PRH which is prolactin releasing hormone, and it seems to be synergistic with TRH, which is the, the thyroid releasing hormone we talked about. And then typically what prevents you from producing milk is prolactin inhibiting hormone, PIH, and it may be related to some dopamine activity as well. So normally men would be producing PIH, Occasionally, men get tumors in the anterior pituitary, and they'll start producing PRA, P, PRH, and PRL, and they'll start getting liquid secretion from the nipple, and then you can usually backtrack that to, to a pituitary tumor. Which is interesting, in my 20 years of teaching, I, I, have, I have two guys after I gave this lecture. I started getting this hip for about a week ago. They both have two territories and they were meaningless. But unfortunately, both of them were caught very early, so they were very fortunate. So, corticotrophs are another uh, cell that we would find in our anterior territory. What controls corticotrophs again is the hypothalamus through CRNH, corticotrophin releasing hormone. And if CRH increases, then the activity of these cells increase. And they increase the production of, of uh, ACTH, or adrenal corticotropic hormone. And then we have a second hormone that the corticotrophs produce, melanocyte stimulating hormone. Uh, and then we, we believe that dopamine is an inhibitor for a bit. And what we need to do is be able to stimulate our melanocytes to produce more melanin. So we do have diseases that we're going to talk about where the body just begins to produce a lot of melanocyte stimulating hormone and then they start to darken even though they're not being exposed to sun. So they get this hyperpigmentation that we can use clinically as a way to diagnose things. Okay. So what we can do with histology is we can look at the interpretation. We can stain it similar to the way we stain the, the red blood cells. So we can use an acidic stain. We can use a basic stain. The acidic stain makes the cells look more red. The basic stain makes the cells look more purple. So same pattern. So what we can do once we've stained it is we can see that we have populations of, of fairly bright pink cells and populations of very purple cells. So the pink cells we call acidophils and somatotrophs that produce human growth hormone and lactotrophs that produce prolactin are our two cells that would be acidophils. Now, at this level, we can't look at this and say that that's a lactotrope and that's a somatotrope. We'd have to do different staining, but we can divide it into populations where, where we can distinguish them. And then the ones that are more purple in color are going to either be corticotrophs that produce ACTH and, and melanocyte stimulating hormone, or thyrotrophs that produce TSH, or gonadotrophs that produce FSH and L. So we these two, so we can take five cells and divide them into two populations, acidophils and basophils. 
right. And then we have a, a, another cell that we're not sure what they do yet. But they're the cells that look like they have nucleus with very light colored cytoplasm. Um, and so what we have then is uh, what we call chromophobes because they don't they don't absorb color. So these light colored staining cells are called chromophores. We're not sure what they do. We do when we look at them closely uh, know that they have secretory granules, meaning that they're producing something on smooth ER and rough ER and they're packaging it with Golgi apparatus. <coughs> but we haven't identified a hormone from them. So if you think the endocrine system is really cool and you want to become an endocrinologist, there's probably a Nobel Prize in the waiting right there to figure out what chromophores are doing. <coughs> How they might impact human so, so what we're going to do is we're going to kind of take a tour through our anterior pituitary membranes, and now instead of worrying about how the hypothalamus impacts the anterior pituitary and the hormones they produce, what we're going to do is we're going to take a step further, and we're going to look at the hormones that the anterior pituitary produce, what their target tissue is, and what their effect is. And in the meantime, I've incorporated the review of this relationship into each one as well. Okay. So the way I did it is on the next group of slides, I put the hypothalamic control mechanism for you. Uh, then I put, uh, and what we're doing is we're looking at a hormone for lactin. So then the target tissue would be this lactiferous tissue in, in the breast and then what the impact is. So one thing you may have noticed is that when women become pregnant, their breasts enlarge in size. And that's because we don't maintain the milk producing tissue of a breast if you're not pregnant. It's an energetic cause. In today's world, that wouldn't be an issue because uh, we tend to have enough food that we aren't trying to win, just maintain our own existence. But if you go to any rural Africa, South American country, where there's poverty, people aren't fat at all, they're having trouble just maintaining their normal biological processes. And when you're in that state, you can't afford to maintain tissue that you don't need. So the long history on Earth is that we haven't always had abundant food that we could kind of do whatever because we have excess energy. So the way, the way the body behaves is you don't need it, you don't, you don't maintain it. And so what happens is, in a non-pregnant woman, this, tissue, this is a pregnant woman's breast that's been sectioned here. In a non-pregnant woman, this would be very, very small, and most of the breast is adipose tissue. And what happens when you become pregnant is this tissue really enlarges so that you have the capacity to produce milk. And so that's all driven by hormones that allows us to do that. So what we need first is estrogen and progesterone that's going to enlarge this tissue. And then right at the birth, then we need the production of prolactin so that you can begin to produce milk. So you have to make the milk producing tissue, and then you can make milk. So men have the same tissue in their breasts. Men get breast cancer. And so if you expose men to estrogen and progesterone, they'll develop breasts. If you expose them to prolactin after that, they can produce milk and breastfeed the baby. Well, because when you're doing the surgery, and I'm, what I'm going to do uh, is to, I was going to section one of the breasts from the cadaver, and, and although she's very old, what you'll be able to see is she's obviously non-pregnant and has been maintaining the breast tissue, is that it's really hard to separate it out of the adipose tissue. So when you do a breast reduction where a woman's really got a lot of massive adipose tissue in her breast, it's easy to damage the milk producing tissue. Yeah. So, it, you know, and some women don't have any problems after breast reduction. Some women have some, some problems with breast reduction. Some women don't produce enough prolactin, so they can't actually breastfeed very well. Other women produce an enormous amount of prolactin, so they can breastfeed. So, before 
formula, babies don't do well on other mammals milk. So cow's milk and goat milk is, is good for babies. So what they used to have is what were called wet nurses. And these were women who were producing more milk than they needed and they would come over and help breastfeed the other babies. So, and there's actually still the organization called the Le Leche League that, that it still connects women if they want uh, with, with other women in the community that are producing abundant milk if they're not producing enough milk. So, so what we see in normal physiology is, is we would have no, no prolactin production if you're not pregnant or haven't been pregnant and if you're male. So what we see is the increase in pro prolactin production because of typically tumors of the pituitary in non-pregnant women and in men. So the normal pathway would be would cause milk production if the, if the breasts have been prepared for nine months ahead of time. So what we end up with then is uh, hyposecretion in women that are trying to breastfeed uh, decreases their milk production. So when women want to stop breastfeeding, then they have to stop having the baby nurse on the nipple. And if they have a partner who likes to also nurse on the nipple, have them stop. <laughs> so my wife has been a physician for a long time. She's had a couple of husbands she had to have come in with their wife and say, OK, she's trying to stop producing milk, so you have to stop having an evening sample as well. And then if you stimulate the, the nipple with just your fingers, it causes milk release. So you have to decrease the stimulation of the nipple. And then what eventually happens is the pressure builds up in the breast and it's uncomfortable for a little while. And then that begins to shut this whole process down. So usually what happens is we see hypersecretion in non-pregnant women. And what we would see is galactorrhea, which is the production of fluid from the nipple in a non-pregnant woman. And usually they'll become amenorrheic, meaning they'll stop having periods. So there are kind of two clinical things that you can tie together. The production of fluids with, with the amenorrhea. So in much of the world, they use nursing as a form of birth control. Because while you're breastfeeding, you tend to be amenorrheic. But it's not a good form of birth control whatsoever. <laughs> Maybe for the first month or so. Uh, what we find is that toward the end of the ovarian cycle, right before a woman starts her period, we get this drop in estrogen and progesterone, but we get an elevation in, in, in prolactin. So that there's some breast tenderness toward, some women have breast tenderness toward the end of their, uh, their ovarian cycle and during their period. And what we see is an increase in that fibrous uh, cyst development. Respect the breast. So there's still prolactin in the There is. Pardon? There's still prolactin in the women. Yes. It doesn't just have to do with pregnancy. Well, post pregnancy. Okay. Yeah. So I, I know from when I was working for a vet with dairy cows that you could try to keep the cow going and producing milk by using the. The, the automatic milkers and stuff because it's stimulating the nipples. But two years out, they're just going to stop. They're going to start decreasing the milk production. So what you have to do is keep them pregnant all, and or post-pregnant all the time so they can produce the milk quality that, that keeps you in business. Yeah. Like so either you're not pregnant, it's like what you're nursing. Right. So, but yeah, but what I'm saying is nine to ten months out, even though you're still nursing, the amount of prolactin would tend to drop. In some women, it's too much longer period of time. I've had a couple of those students that told me that they were still producing some milk two and a half years after they stopped breastfeeding. Small amounts of milk. Because we're one of the few countries that only breastfeeds for less than a year. Yeah. Yeah, if you look at underdeveloped countries, they breastfeed for 10 years. They're probably either pregnant, post-pregnant, and or have three, four-year-old, five-year-olds to breastfeed. Because that's, they don't have enough energy 
uh, and they're all malnourished. And so what you trade is the woman's health for the baby's health. And so what you see in underdeveloped countries where women breastfeed for extensive periods of time is the average age of mortality drops into the 60s versus the 80s in the United States. So I was in a remote town in, in um, Baja, California, and I was sitting in a cantina porch, and there was a woman that walked down the street. There's a little park in front of the cantina. She sat on a she sat on a bench, and she had a baby that she was breastfeeding. She had three kids. I guess the oldest was four or five. And they all took turns on the other breast while she was breastfeeding because they're impoverished and they have no more food. And someone gives up her longevity for the child. Yeah. So in that instance, they you could be you could have prolactin for ten years, prolactin for ten years because you have, don't have birth control. So. So you're either pregnant or nursing or, or nursing elder or older kids as well. It's very different. Yeah. Yeah. Do, like in, you see in animals right after their breast hydration options that are fertile for a short period of time right after very fertile when they go to that end? Um, do you remember that too? Or do you have a peak right no. after? So the other thing you'd see in men is not only would you get galactorrhea, which is the production of fluid from the nipple, but that would be erectile dysfunction. So young men that can have that tumor would have trouble getting eruptions as well as clinical signs. Uh, so what we're going to do is we're going to finish up with the brain before we move down in the body. So we've been talking about the hypothalamus here. And if the two carries no longer in place, it would have been right there. So if we look at the corpus callosum and go posterior to the thalamus, right above where the cerebellum was, which has been cut off this way, there's a little gland called the pineal gland. The pineal gland has been of interest to anatomists for literal centuries, since we first discovered it. And it was discovered in animals because it's usually quite large compared to humans. And it really controls their seasonal reproductive activity on why moose and deer are only seasonally reproductive, whereas humans are reproductive on a monthly basis. And then our domesticated animals like cows are, are more productive. So what was tying it together is the ability to of a young to get to a maturation point by the next winter to survive it. So, so what you have to do is tie this whole process of when the, when the female becomes pregnant, how long the gestational age is, and then the ability of the young to maturate to a point to survive the next adverse environment, which would be the next winter. So that's why moose and elk and deer mate in the fall. The, the females carry through the winter. The babies are born in the spring, so they can maturate to uh, survive the next winter. And so the pineal gland controls that in most lower animals, uh, amphibians, reptiles, birds, uh, but not in humans, in mice, and, and a few things. So what was fascinating to early anatomists was, well, what the heck does it do in humans? Because it's obvious that we're not tying this reproductive pattern together. So uh, the French uh, scientists and philosopher Descartes thought that it was where our soul is. So they actually did some research to see if, if people had different sizes of pineal glands and see if it related to them being, having a, a deeper soul. I always thought that was pretty fascinating. But the, much of our history is trying to interpret what we're seeing with very little understanding. And then as we progress, we change the story because we understand more and more. Now what we know is that the pineal gland produces two hormones. So melatonin uh, is regulated by light, and it's due to uh, a light uh, responsive enzyme, which is called serotonin in uh, acetyltransferase. So what happens is during daylight hours, serotonin builds up in your body. Uh, because the pineal gland is producing serotonin. And then as light begins to diminish uh, toward evening, then this, this 
light affected enzyme converts serotonin to melatonin. So what we end up with is a, a pattern where during daylight hours serotonin is elevated and during nighttime hours melatonin is, is elevated. So what happens is that melatonin, melatonin increases at night and decreases during the day. And it's responsible for our circadian rhythms or 24 hour clock. It's responsible for making you sleepy at night. Uh, and so it induces sleep. What we know is if you produce too much melatonin, you will be sleepy all the time. And so we also know that, particularly in northern latitudes where day length is limited, so if you go to Fairbanks, Alaska, it, there's only uh, sunlight in the wintertime from about 11 to 1, and it's dark the rest of the time, that melatonin levels go way, way up, and it increases uh, depression, alcoholism, abusive behavior patterns. So that it's called seasonal affective disorder that, that we see here sad. And in jet lag. So what we know is that if you're flying across the world and you're, you want to end up in the world uh, feeling better so you can be active right away instead of having this, oh my God, then you can take melatonin as a supplement. So I, I thought it was really cool. Last spring, a year ago, I, between spring and summer, I flew to Saipan, which is, is south of, of Australia, just uh, north of Australia, actually, uh, just almost on the equator. And so since I left Seattle and flew west, I, I, the plane tracked the, the sun. So I left Seattle at, uh, at 7, 6.30 in the morning. Uh, 28 hours later, I was in Saipan, and it never seemed nightness, never seemed darkness. So I get in Saipan, it's 9.30 at night there, and I feel, well, I feel great. I go to the bar, have a drink, get sleepy, go to bed. On the way back, 28 hours, I went through night on the plane and couldn't sleep. And when I get back to Seattle, I was just gone. It took me like two days to recover. It's just amazing. So if I had taken melatonin on the flight home, it would have been like I was on the way there. So it's pretty amazing what this does. And then hyposecretion is directly linked to insomnia, people with insomnia, not probably speaking. So there's kind of a, an interesting, uh, there's a really interesting uh, hormone reflex that isn't well understood, but women, when they go through menopause, oftentimes tend to have more and more insomnia where they cannot sleep. They wake up in the middle of the night, like they'll go to sleep quickly and then wake up at one and they can't get back to sleep until five or six. And we know that estrogen replacement therapy moderates that. So the interesting connection between uh, drop in, in estrogen and progesterone and what's going on here in this professor. Where men typically don't have the issue until much later in the world. So serotonin is a very interesting hormone in that it acts as a chemical messenger. Uh, and, and transmitting signals as a neurotransmitter. And it's also released in the blood. And so it can act as a hormone and a neurotransmitter. What we know is that it's involved in the inhibition of anger and rage and aggression. And so studies that were done on two people that tend to be, have more violent behavior patterns and people that don't have shown some significant differences in circulating serotonin. And then what I found fascinating is that it also helps regulate body temperature. And elderly people have a drop in serotonin and they're cold all the time. My mother still puts on a winter coat and yesterday and she was cold. You got to be in that. And because they have trouble regulating their body temperature. We know it's involved in, in mood swing shifts and, and induction and vomiting involved in appetite changes, sexuality. And then there was a recent study that was pretty cool. And it was done on college students. And they were looking at college students that were single that had no significant other. They were looking at a group of college students that had recently broken up with their significant other. And they were looking at college students that were in a stable relationship with their significant other. And they found out of those three populations, 
the highest serotonin levels were in people in stable relationships. So then the question was, is the relationship stable because of serotonin, or is the serotonin elevated because of the feeling of love? And so that's the question mark here, and it's pretty interesting. So then the, where they were going to go next with this is they were going to look at divorced people and divorced people who were in an amiable divorce, but pe or people that were in a very aggressive, antagonistic divorce, and to see what serotonin levels were, were, were doing in those people. So it may be linked to that love at first sin, because our, our serotonin levels. I always kid my students that because of pheromones, it's really love at first sight, not love at first <laughs> So what we do is, is there is something called serotonin syndrome. Oftentimes, the amazing thing is we don't see it naturally that often, but we see it from drug interactions with drugs that were given by a, a neurologist over here, a cardiologist over here, a nephrologist here, all trying to manage different problems in the patient. And so they have all these drugs on board, where it can actually uh, uh, lead to death. <laughs> and so we do see it as potentially life-threatening due to adverse drug interactions. And then what we do know is that with hyposecretion, because you need serotonin to be converted to melatonin, that you can't get as much melatonin if your serotonin is really low. So it may lead to insomnia. And it's been looked at again, in, particularly in um, in uh, people who both had insomnia and very uh, quick anger and aggressive behavior problems. It's, it's been looked at in that kind of as a relationship. So. What we're going to do in this lecture is we're going to continue with our anterior pituitary hormones and kind of, again, go from what the hormone is that the anterior pituitary produces what's its target tissue, what's the effect of that target tissue. And so uh, we're, we're going to start with somatotrophs. So remember somatotrophs are cells of our anterior pituitary. They actually uh, produce human growth hormone. And human growth hormone is controlled again by hypothalamic control, uh, GH, RH, or GH, IH. And in the target tissue for human growth hormones, general body cells, particularly bone, muscle, cartilage, and the liver. Uh, and so the way it works is that it targets cells to produce an internal messenger. And the internal messenger is insulin-like growth factor. And so what happens is human growth hormone targets cells like bone cells, muscle cells, <coughs> causes them to produce this insulin-like growth factor. And the insulin-like growth factor affects the activity of the cell. So generally, it increases uh, growth patterns in the cell by increasing protein synthesis, uh, the use of fats for energy, uh, and carbohydrate metabolism. And then in adults, instead of controlling growth, what we have is the fact that it maintains muscle mass, bone mass, and promotes healing and tissue repair. So what we have is two suites of athletes that tend to abuse it. Teenagers that buy human growth hormone to increase their growth rates quicker so that by the time they're a freshman in college, they already, they already look like they're a senior in college, so they can compete with the older athletes. And then, and then major athletes like you've seen in the news, like Barry Bonds, some other people, because as you age, you may have questioned, you may have questioned why are all uh, pro athletes in their 20s, and usually by the time you're in your late 20s, early 30s, late 30s, you're done. You cannot compete with these other people. It's because you, you have trouble as you age maintaining muscle mass and bone mass. So they tend to use uh, human growth hormone to try to maintain muscle mass and bone mass. So, so what happens with hypersecretion and hyposecretion? Well, during uh, during development in childhood, if you don't produce enough uh, human growth hormone, then you become what we call a pituitary dwarf, which is a normal person that's just very, very small. 
but they're normally proportioned torso to, to leg and arm length. Whereas other type of dwarfism, you get long torsos and short legs and long arms. So it's a very different pattern of development. So now what we do is we have well baby checks where you go in and you plot weight and height curves. And if you start falling way off, then they can assay for blood levels of human growth hormone, and we can actually use human growth hormone injections to control the growth process. So that we don't see pituitary dwarfism in the United States much anymore in populations that have adequate health care. So we, we do see it in underserved populations and in worldwide in underserved populations. So what happens if you have hypersecretion during childhood and you end up with gigantism? There's a guy that was recruited out of China uh, by Duke University to play basketball. He was seven foot eight as a, a 19 year old. And when they brought him in the United States, they had to do a physical on him and they found he had a pituitary tumor which was driving the growth. And then during adulthood, because your epiphyseal plates fuse, then long bones can no longer grow, but short bones and irregular bones can still grow. So what you end up with is a disease called acromeglia, where you get the enlargement of your hands and feet, you get the enlargement of the cranium, the nose, the lower jaw. The tongue can get larger and larger and larger, and that's why this guy's sticking his tongue out. He's got acromeglia and a really large tongue. Or it can actually begin to suffocate people at night because it collapses on the airway. Their liver enlarges, which is why the problem with athletes is all this stuff goes on. If their epiphyseal plates are fused, then athletes who take human growth hormone, their, their feet enlarge, their hands enlarge, their liver enlarges, and kidneys enlarge, which can lead to significant health problems, which is why we don't recommend it. So let me finish this one, then I'll turn you loose, and then we can finish uh, one meeting tomorrow and do lecture two, and we'll be in time, and then elaborate in part of the lecture three and four. So dwarfism is typically caused by two reasons, a tumor, and the most common tumor is a, is a tumor in the nasal pharynx uh, associated with the sphenoid bone. Uh, so it grows in the roof of your nasal pharynx. Uh, and so it grows near the pituitary gland. And the symptoms we would see in children with this tumor would be complaints of headaches, vomitings, uh, as it gets worse, double vision, uh, excessive amount of water consumption, drinking, and sleep disturbances. And then the other reason is actually a gene mutation. So we see it uh, based upon a gene mutation. And what we do with human chromosomes is we line them all up and we look at how, where the centriole is relative to the little arms. So some chromosomes we have have little arms and big arms. Some chromosomes we have have equal size arms. And what they did is by putting all the chromosomes together with the way they look, is they just number one through 21 for our chromosomes. And what we do know is that we've got, we've got some mutated areas on chromosome three and on chromosome seven. And people who have mutated areas on those two chromosomes uh, tend to, to have dwarfism as well. So, so we just as well. So, and then if you, with the Human Genome Project, it's really kind of cool because not only can you look at chromosome three, but you can look at a specific site on chromosome three called P11, and that's where the mutation actually occurs is on that specific site. So. So these are a couple of examples of gigantism. <laughs> this is a lady standing next to a dwarf. <laughs> Comparison side by side. These are two siblings, two sisters, one with a tumor, one without a tumor. And what it leads to is the body gets so big that it, goes, it, it, it doesn't function well. This is a woman with acromeglia, with a full-blown acromeglia, where her maxilla has grown, her mandible has grown, her nose has grown, her forehead has grown. So we get this reorganization of, of the... Uh, and what you see these is pretty interesting. Too. Now when I look at a picture of a former president, President Nixon, he's got that classy 
made from any of the material space. Anyway. So once you see them, it's fun to go to the mall. <laughs> I don't like shopping, so I really don't like So it's, it's most often diagnosed in middle age. People with fat tree results in serious problems premature death. In most people, it's very slow with the stinky onset. So it may be long diagnosed for quite a while. So let me do the symptoms and then a little, little quit. So what you see is somebody can play a lot of a joint pain. Teenagers have joint pain, adults or shouldn't have joint pain, unless they were doing strenuous stuff that they aren't used to doing. But if you have somebody who has joint pain, you know, well, I, you didn't do any strenuous exercise without a norm, then it's a concern. Uh, actually, the skin gets thicker and you know, your sebaceous glands get more active. Uh, you also get little, what we call skin tags, where you get keratoses, where you get thickening of the the epidermis in regions where you get these little skin tags. You get a large loose nose and tongue like the woman had. Deepening of the voice, particularly in women, her voice will become very deep uh, because you get an enlargement of the vocal cords. Uh, sleep apnea where people stop breathing at night and then we'll go for a minute or two and, then, and the brain jolts and then you're breathing again. Uh, excessive sweating and skin odor. These are people that they shower and shower and shower and they still smell. Fatigue and weakness, headaches, and third vision. You know, oftentimes with women, you get, you get irregular menstrual cycles. And you can also get discharge from the breast of a clear liquid. So then you have to tease out whether it's a tumor producing prolactin or, or a tumor uh, that's actually producing increasing human growth hormone. In men, you typically get erectile dysfunction. Both men and women, you get a loss of sex drive um, and that improves. Okay, so we're going to finish this one next time. Do lecture two.